Forest Health and again it's in based in, in the science um, that applies to the effects of climate change. So climate change is having a number of negative effects on the forests in the Gunnison Basin and really the state of the country um, broadly. Drought is one of the most uh, significant factors that kind of dictates a lot of the other effects on their subsequently happening to the forest. So as the trees dry out, um, they become more stressed, more susceptible to any of these other problems as well. So wildfire becomes obviously a bigger issue um, as things become drier and warmer in general. On top of on top of that dryness, of trees being dried out, being stressed, much more susceptible um, to wildfires and <clears throat> a lot less uh, resiliency among the trees themselves, so a lot more mortality and just overall um, complete burn. Video kill is one of the, one of the things as well that uh, proliferates more, because as the trees become drought stricken and stressed, um, they become more or less resistant to uh, the beetles, which also prey on trees that have been more stressed. So video kill, which is normally, you know, just a uh, natural part of the ecosystem where a few, a few trees die here and there has become a significant problem with huge swaths of forests being completely destroyed. And then disease such as the sudden aspen decline, as the trees become more, more stressed, uh, their ability to become, be resistant to disease, uh, is, they become more resistant to, or less resistant to disease and uh, there's more problem with that. On top of the, <coughs> these direct effects of climate change, we also have a lot of other effect, uh, pressures affecting forests. Human development is what we um, a lot more people living in the human wildland interface, uh, the urban wildland interface. Um, maybe not so much in Gunnison County, but at least in other parts of the state. There's a lot more increase into the forested areas, which creates a lot of pressures on the forest themselves just through deforestation, through human activity, and also through um, fire management activity. So through most of the 20th century, there was a, a, the practice of total suppression of wildfires, in part to protect human development and also just because there was a lack of knowledge of what would the better practice of <coughs> fire management be. So there's a large increase in fuel loads, which people are now managing for, um, but there still leaves a lot of more potential for, for increased wildfire and then with trees dying off and eco kill and disease, um, these things are kind of compounding together to create just really bad situations. Invasive plants is another factor as, you know, things like cheatgrass, for example, become even more, cheatgrass and wildfire would work together to really uh, cheap grass is wildfire, wildfire promotes cheap grass. And so that just kind of adds, adds another component. So putting all these things together just puts a lot of stress and a lot of pressure on um, forests in general uh, for increased problems. And as climate change continues to get worse, you know, expect uh, worse problems. So here's a, here's a chart showing average annual temperature in the Gunnison Basin for the past 100 or so years, and I don't know how many of you are aware, but it is increasing. <laughs> so as that's expected to increase, you can only expect that all those pressures are also going to increase along with that over the next few decades, centuries. Here we've got uh, naturally the different types of forests in the valley. So it's like, based on this, you know, it looks like we've got mostly spruce and fir, significant amount of lodgepole, ponderosa pine, and then in yellow here, I don't know if you can read that, that's the rest of the spur. And then a little bit of alpine tundra up in the higher elevations. So when you look at all this and you think about some of the beetles, um, spruce beetle, mountain pine beetle, its beetle, uh, there's obviously a lot of potential for significant devastation. And I mean, right now the Gunnison, Gunnison forests are uh, Mostly, mostly doing pretty well to face these beetles, but 
you can see here, this is what we've got in red is this is beetle activity um, from the decade 2000 to 2011, and in blue, just in 2012. So at the top, that's Gunnison County. You can see there's a little beetle activity in the southwest um, over that first decade. So I don't know if you went on the field trip last semester to Lake City. Um, it was a pretty salient picture of how how much forest can be destroyed. And the guys of forest are looking pretty pretty good right now, but you can just see based on this decade and then just the year of 2012 in blue, uh, that was a significant spread of the beetle just for that one year. <clears throat> so with this being the case, with all the uh, factors of climate change and the pressures on the forest, uh, the human pressures in addition to that, the expects expectation of increase temperature warming, increasing drought, and all those pressures, and the proximity of um, beetle outbreaks. You can only predict that in the near future, uh, forests in the Gunnison Basin are going to be significantly impacted by the beetle and all these other pressures. So from exploring uh, different land agencies and talking to some resource managers in the Gunnison uh, Basin, um, they have, uh, we discovered that this is the largest beetle outbreak in current history. Um, the epidemic is um, very notable for its intensity, um, its extensive geological range, and its um, occurrence in, a simultaneous occurrence in, in many different ecosystems. Um, so uh, the infestation of uh, the spruce beetle has been on the rise in in Grand Mesa and the Ancapadre and the Gunnison National Forest, which we all know it as GMUD. Um, and uh, in the GMUD, there's been several studies on tree, tree, rings, um, tree ring studies and looking at weather and climate data. And it has suggested that it's been the warmest and driest um, decade in centuries. Um, and this warm and dry um, climate is really um, reducing tree vigor, reducing the tree health, and it's actually um, producing, and it's suitable for spruce beetles to, um, and all beetles, to have a better success rate at invading our, our tree stands. So to give you a little bit of perspective, um, in the state of Colorado, there are <coughs> 311,000 acres um, identified with a spruce beetle, and 85,000 of those acres are right here within the GMA. Um, so the trend towards earlier snow melt and higher peak uh, stream runoff is actually um, corresponding with a higher growth rate, or no, sorry, higher growing season. And then it, the higher growing season is corresponding with um, higher water requirements. So the, the species in our area are not getting the water requirements that is needed to um, sustain a healthy forest. And these trees are becoming extremely stressed. So what happens when they become stressed kind of sends signals back and forth to the beetles and the chemoreceptors in the beetles go all crazy and they change all their behaviors and they can actually select for these stressed trees, which then increases more beetles. Um, and some of the resource managers out of the Park Service um, informed me that um, some research that was done out of CSU has shown that in our pinion pine forest and their corresponding beetle, the Ips beetle, um, it has the drier and warmer climates have actually changed their life cycles. And they're producing two flights, they're, they're reprodu reproducing twice in one season rather than historically they would reproduce once in one season. Um, so also during these spruce beetle um, outbreaks, um, widespread tree mortality, mortality <laughs> reduces forest carbon uptake and actually increases emissions by the dead and decaying trees. Um, so this graph here is actually showing um, the increase in spruce beetle. This was done from an aerial detection survey. And you can see in 2008, we're looking at some 50,000 acres that have been infested. And in 2012, pretty huge amount increase, huge increase up to 300,000 acres that are infested. 
So this is um, looking at 2013 spruce beetle activity here in the Gunnison Basin. You can see Gunnison here, and this is Blue Mesa. Um, the black dots, I'm not sure how clear you can all see that, but black dots are representing um, where spruce beetle activity had been noted in the past and are no longer there. Um, the red dots are looking at active um, beetle colonies. And you can see down here, um, the red splotches are actual um, spruce decay or, or infected areas with, with dying spruce trees. <laughs> so, looking into the future, this is a projection um, from the Forest Service, from the research from the Forest Service, and this is looking at just a moderate increase in CO2 emissions. And this is a 2016 spruce habitat. And uh, the red is showing a loss of spruce stands. Um, the pale, I guess we went with the word khaki, is uh, looking at threatened species. And the green is emerging or, or, or stands that are, are um, withholding the pressures. And what's really alarming to me is this is the whole elk mountain range. And so, looking at this, we are um, kind of in a unique situation in, in, within the GMUG and looking at um, prevention for the future, which Liz is going to go into in more depth in a minute. But um, the Forest Service informed me that they actually have a health insect pest funding account, which other agencies within GMUG can apply to and get funding to support any of their biotechs or geotechs as long as they provide surveys of their lands looking for uh, piss beetles or pine beetles or any, any sort of tree decay. Um, it's actually how one of our positions was funded for the Park Service, was, was funded through the insect pest funding account. And so local strategies that um, Forest Service and the agencies here in GMUG are really looking at are human safety, forest recovery, and long-term forest resilience. So, with that being said, um, the guidance of basic communities need to take immediate action because it will get more costly and more difficult to address in the long term way. Um, so, the basic research and planning needs is the <coughs> methods for modeling and projecting the impacts of climate change and beetle kills, um, avoid human development in areas that have Going to be um, in high people areas or in more urban area systems. <coughs> and also identify areas that are more susceptible and prioritize management efforts. Um, some basic locally relevant next steps include monitor forest health and community adaptive management Open <coughs> access for commercial harvesting and use of funds to um, use of funds generated for <coughs> and conduct field treatments to regulate standards. The GMAT National Forest issued a beetle um, and forest health report, I think it was in 2012, with the basic goals of human safety, forest recovery, and forest resilience. The first goal is to ensure that people and community infrastructures are protected from the hazards and quality of spruce beetle trees and elevated wildfire potential. Um, so some actions to achieve this goal would be to um, prevent falling trees from harming people and infrastructure, conduct immediate fuel treatment um, in areas that have new outbreaks, Remove hazard trees from highest priority trails and wreck uh, areas. Develop a system for warning the public of hazard trees and bark beetle outbreaks. And conduct research to describe site specific factors that um, influence the susceptibility of bark beetle outbreaks. The second goal is aimed at recovery um, and to re establish forest. So some actions to achieve these goals include uh, place fuel grades across the landscape, seed and plant trees to increase forest diversity and recovery, preserve invasive plant species, 
and conduct research to determine the ecological effects of um, function, structure, and composition of forest landscapes. Um, all those actions are aimed to establish and maintain diverse forest damage by a park. And the third goal is to achieve resiliency and prevent, prevent or mitigate future mosquito outbreaks. Um, by doing this, we can increase diversity of age class and tree species in the forest through silvicultural techniques. Um, these techniques are aimed to allow natural regeneration to occur and reduce competition and reduce susceptibility of um, fuel spread. Reduce sand density to um, and increase spaces in between trees and apply prescribed curves certain forms to reduce the We also need to conduct research to understand the mechanisms behind the scale epidemic and um, the influence of climate change. So this is a graph that's of uh, the entire state of Colorado. So it's a little bit different for Madison County, but as you can see, it's going to be a whole community effort, not just the forest. And community involvement is essential in this process. Um, by conducting a, by creating a communication plan to explain the strategy, purpose, and the need for bark beetle management is um, important for many communities. And we also wish to um, engage research and development in ways that um, promote sharing The beetle epidemic is expanding and accelerating and is projecting to um, increase with the onset of climate change. The situation requires an increased response across the West and will require prioritization um, of specific areas. And we need to focus our goals to achieve human safety, um, forest recovery, and forest recovery.
wants to part is to uh, promote different technologies to optimize the use of these phenol kill trees. So things like final chemical biofuels and biofuels. It's also a really beautiful wood. It's good homes. It's a lot of moldy. So um, it was labeled as figure three, but um, but it, it, it's essentially showing the forest losses, right? And then and then Brad, you started by or you, you introduced the figure by by saying CO2 emissions are going to result or right, these losses. Um, but then the overall yeah, so the overall theme was beetle kill. Is so are you saying that there's a correlation between CO2 emissions and beetle kill? Uh, yes. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trick question. No, 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 it's just that I don't know if you can. I'm just like thinking really simply that yes, CO2 emissions are increasing our global <coughs> and creating as the climate that's drier and more sensitive for our spruce stands to be threatened. Okay. So um, I maybe I should have read the study a little bit more, but it was based off several different scenarios. Um, and this was like after moderate CO2, after a moderate increase in CO2 emissions. This was the projection for 2060. So would, so based on this, would you recommend more adaptation strategies or more mitigation strategies? Right, because, because there's CO2 increase, but then there's fuel kill. Yeah, I, I think it goes along with like, the forest resilience, see, that it needs to be uh, mitigations. I'm not really sure how we would get that. Well, I mean, we could adapt, of course, but I mean, this is a quite a large loss. I would think the needs of mitigation actually started now, which I believe is a frame. And so based on that third goal right from this report, um, was there one mitigation action that was not discussed that, that you folks would say, hey, I think this could be a really innovative thing, right? That could be, you know, locally relevant that folks would, would, would really jump on, jump on and be excited to, to work around? Um, it wasn't, it didn't really mention one specifically. I think it was just it was, uh, trying to propose a, an entire, like a, a lot of all the different mitigation strategies. Feel great to prescribe for and think of general accommodation.
2 degrees, 4 degrees. Oh, and of course this is moderate, right? So this is a bit more than moderate. Right. Yeah. And with more tree loss, there's less force <coughs> and there's less trees to get out of here. So mm -hmm. Then again, the dying, we had dying and decay trees are producing more emissions. Yeah. I just give you guys some clarify this. So there's been a lot of funding for mitigation of, of the spruce beetle, right? It, what, what is the what is the reasoning behind that? Is it for fire mitigation to try and prevent these wild out these huge outbreaks of fire? Is it to try and sustain our forest stand viability for like commercial harvest? Or is there is there like another like overriding like healthy watershed reason for trying to do this? Because it seems like with uh, increasing CO2 emissions that this is kind of an inevitable thing, right? And so maybe those funds that are generated maybe could be spent someplace else. What, what is the... I don't think there's big one big, big overlying reason. I mean, it encompasses everything you just said. Yeah. And I mean, to have a, a healthy, sustaining forest, I mean, really addresses everything you just said. I mean, the product, like timber production in this area, it might be a little higher in this area than other uh, regions in Colorado, but it's still pretty low productive according to like, other states. So I'm not sure if it's really for commercial harvesting use, but it would benefit that though if we had a productive, productively continuing to be a healthy resilient forest. A lot of work to put that sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, even in, just in general, I mean, that, like just. Aside from all the other things you mentioned, just a healthy ecosystem in general is desirable. A lot of, a lot of invasive plant management things across the country are just you know, like healthy ecosystems. So on top of everything else, how they talk about healthy ecosystems in general is desirable. I think what he's getting at too is the promotion of wildlife habitat in these areas as well. Thank you, guys.